previously in our last episode. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. <coughs> and just ahead. And giving you a warm, tingly feeling down there. OG Creations is filmed before a live studio audience. Of two cats. G here from OG Creations. Happy Christmas! Oh, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! I hope that your stocking got stuffed last night and you received everything you asked Santa to give you. Some of you will get cat beds and the others will get pillow lights. Oh. If your YouTube views are anything like mine, then I am certain you have seen the beginning of this commercial 10 to 15 times a day. Basically, it's this thing just for your tool shed. I want to know. How many of you received or gifted that special person in your life one of these? What's this? Solely and honestly because you know the very first thing that any man is going to slide into it is his dick. Christmas. Dig in a box. For many years, Kay and I participated in the Jewish Christmas Day tradition. Hanukkah. Dig in a box. Of going to a 10 or an 11 a.m. movie hitting our favorite restaurant in the International District, and then being home before 2 p.m. just to sleep the day away. It was a lot of fun. No hassle, no fuss, just a fun day out and spending time together. Time However, the thing we enjoy the most now is finding the sanctuary of our own home. We fill ourselves with a non-standard bangers and mash, piping hot Yorkshire puddings, and the most delicious and richest red onion gravy you've ever tasted. Then we nestle in between our two cats, dozing in and out of the ultimate relaxation comas while watching our favorite holiday films. The Holiday, Hate My Horrible Life, Love Actually, I is a lot of legs, David. And in our home, Shaun of the Dead. Shaun. Yeah. I can't wait to rip these clothes off and gorge myself to sleep. But first, we have some business to take care of. We're going to be watching the sixth episode of Nigella's Christmas Kitchen, filmed in 2008, and it's the ultimate of Christmas feasts, turkey and all the trimmings. Crack those crackers, put on your crowns, read all of those jokes. What does Miley Cyrus have at Christmas? It's worky. Because it's time to get hungry. We all know what we want out of Christmas dinner. At its best, it can be unimaginably joyous. I mean, there's no other word for it. But at its worst, it can be tear-inducing and fraught. But it's that rich panoply, the mixture of so many dishes, that makes it the feast it is. I love this meal. I love it far too much to risk anything going wrong. So I have devised my plan of action, and I use it year in, year out. And I'm not just enthusiastic, I am Evangelical. Evangelical. My countdown begins on Christmas Eve with a bucket, several litres of cold water and the turkey. I bring tidings of comfort and joy and this <laughs> is the means by which I do it. It's not some elaborate Christmas parlor trick, or not quite. What it is, is the means by which you need never ever worry about having a dried up turkey again. It is a miracle bath, a spice bath, starting off with that wonderfully Christmas spice, the clove, some caraway seed, gorgeous months of caraway, the warmth of star anise, Mustard seeds. Just a little bit of heat of a different sort. Some allspice berries. These are wonderful. You can see, just throw everything with abandon. How can that be anything other than beautiful? 
and some cinnamon. Gorgeous Christmassy scent and fabulous warmth from the cinnamon. And so that's the spices, quite a lot of them, but they need help to ooze their way into the turkey. This is not a marinade, this is a brine. Salt is what turns this into a liquid that will permeate the turkey, bringing all the spice with it and keeping everything moist while it cooks. Brine is not just salty liquid, it's sugary salty liquid. A bit. So a bit of sugar, but I don't want just sweetness, I want some taste with it. In particular, that gorgeous resiny depth of maple syrup. Onions, I think, are always the basic unit of savouriness in cooking, and you do need to add some here. You won't suddenly find you've got some strangely flavoured turkey, which tastes of spices and onion. It doesn't. It just somehow gives it a bit more fullness. So it's not just the fact that it stays juicy. It's got a sort of wonderful fullness of taste. I think the same goes with ginger, too. That great heat. Oranges, too. Very Christmassy. Just want a quarter of this. Spritz the juice. It's also a flavour purveyor and a force for tenderisation. If you've got some parsley knocking about the kitchen, add that, and I always do. Some leaves, stalks and all. Everything provides its own scent. OK, so there we are. Fragrant bath water is ready. I'm now going to go and get the baby to pop in it. This is a very traditional wet brine. Basically, you just crack open a bouquet garni, throw some onions in, and let your turkey go for a little swim for a few days. I used to wet brine our turkeys all the time. They're delicious, they're super moist, everyone loves them. However, the last couple of years, I've been doing a dry brine, which is pretty much just a rub. For a 22 pound turkey, it is eight tablespoons of kosher salt, six tablespoons of freshly cracked black pepper, one and a half tablespoons of each granulated sugar and smoked paprika. Now you have to wear gloves because the smoked paprika will definitely make your hands red for a few days. The Tuesday night before Thanksgiving, I rinse the turkey, pat it as dry as it can be, and then put this rub inside and out all over the bird. Then I put it on a sheet pan, wrap it with clean film, and put it in the refrigerator. When you are ready to cook, unwrap it, do not rinse it. You wanna keep all that rub on there and put it directly into a turkey tin. I always use one of those disposable aluminum ones that you can find at any grocery store. The ones with the high sides and the little fakie handles. I usually double them up though because 22 pounds is a little heavy for some aluminum foil. I put that on a sheet pan and put it into a preheated oven of 425 Fahrenheit for about an hour and a half. Then I reduce the temperature down to 325 for the next four and a half to five hours, basting every 20 minutes until that turkey is done, which is 160 degrees Fahrenheit. I then take it out and let it rest for the next 30 to 45 minutes until it is at temperature and ready to carve. This liquid is not just spice water, it's a magical elixir. It's gonna transform the turkey and it's going to be super juicy and gorgeously spiced. My fridge isn't large enough to fit the bucket in, so I leave it outside securely covered. Now I used to do that too. Uh, the brine that I would always have our turkey in was way too large and way too heavy for any American refrigerator. So I would always put it into our freezing garage. Next, it's time to set out my Christmas schedule. best way of approaching this is to get a pad, a cup of tea, a pen and start writing a list. Well obviously tomorrow we do know that the turkey will have to go in the oven and be basted a bit but that's fine so we write that down. She is using what one I of those aluminum pins as well. every Christmas day morning I get started on the gravy and this is an allspice gravy and for me it takes all the stress out of normal gravy making. No last minute tinkering about with baking. And if you've never tried giblet gravy it is an absolute must. It is delicious. Now, don't follow the old Southern recipes of adding chopped hard-boiled eggs because that's bullshit. Nobody wants that. It really does add so much flavor to your stock, which then will add even more intensified flavor to your gravies. 
Tomorrow too, I want to do my perfect roast potatoes and they really are the ne plus ultra of the potato world. There's my maple roast parsnips. These are more heavenly than you can believe and luckily incredibly easy to make. I've also got to have tomorrow Brussels sprouts. When you need Brussels sprouts at Christmas, you have to. I cook them and then I toss them in butter, pancetta, chestnuts and marsala. And I have to say, Christmas Day would not be Christmas Day without the smell of bread sauce wafting through the house. It's my mother's bread sauce and I make it year in, year out. So right now, that leaves me not much to do, all of it pleasurable. Oh, this is gonna take forever with her. When it comes to Thanksgiving and Christmas, I know I'm always looking for any trick that will help me save time. So what I have done is whenever I find a recipe that I love and I know I'm gonna wanna repeat at some point, I take a couple of minutes and type the whole thing up and save it as a Word doc on my computer. Then every season, I have a folder for Thanksgiving 2023, Christmas 2023. And I always drop those recipes in there. So when the day comes or the week comes for prep, I can always just go in there select all of those files and just print them and I have all of my recipes right there and I'm not going through multiple books trying to find that one recipe I loved. I also do the same thing with a grocery list. I type up all the ingredients from all the recipes for that holiday that I loved and have it in the same file. Then I can just take it to my kitchen, mark through all of the ingredients that I currently have and don't need to purchase again. And then I have a prepared and ready to go list for the store. The Lawsonian staple rum butter has to be. I've got the work of moments with my redder than red cranberry sauce. But first of all, I want to start off with the gingerbread stuffing. And to get cracking on that, I do no more than get a few onions, a couple of apples, peel them, quarter them, blitz them in the processor, and then cook them gently in a pan with a bit of butter and olive oil. This gingerbread stuffing is so full-bodied, so full-flavoured, that yes, you can certainly stuff the turkey with it, but it really can hold its own if you just shove it into a baking dish and slip it into the oven alongside the turkey tomorrow. The onions and apples, now gorgeous and buttery, are soft and completely cooked, so I'm going to get on with the bacon. And the bacon here, with its saltiness, is so good against the sweet, sharp apples and those savoury onions. A lot of bacon here. Many times when you read a recipe for stuffing, it says belly pork. I find using streaky bacon, don't use back bacon, works just as well. Splits this until it's pink pulp. Right. It's going to be quite full with all the bacon in, so you probably need to make this a two spatula job and turn slowly and patiently and if I can do that anyone can don't expect the bacon to crisp up or even color it'll stay pink you just want it to be cooked through a bit the boost the Christmas flavor here by zesting a clementine in For no culinary reason, but just because I don't want to burn my hands, I'm going to let this cool a bit while I get on with crumbling the gingerbread. This announces itself on the packet as ginger cake, but I call it gingerbread, and no doubt you call it gingerbread too. And I, I trust say, all of her recipes. One moment, this one shows may be too if you're far a food obsessive, every moment is useful. I was thinking about how to stuff the turkey, and I thought, well, since stuffing is always made with breadcrumbs, why did I have to use normal bread? Why couldn't I use, say, gingerbread? So, of course, I tried it, and I am a complete convert. Turkey has got a delicate flavour, and that's one of the things I love about it. But for that reason, it really works well with a robust stuffing with such punch. I've got the first loaf crumbled. I'm now going to start mixing the gingerbread in with the bacon, onion and apple. In this goes. Most of it in the bowl. Right. I'm going to crumble this in too. Mm. 
gorgeous smell. Because this bowl is pretty full, I have to say the easiest way to mix is by hand. Mm, this is very therapeutic and very pleasing. And I'm done. This is cooked, it's mixed. I'll put it in the fridge and then it'll be ready to go in the oven tomorrow. It's not just children who love rituals at Christmas. You know, I have to say that I, as the family cook, really love them as well. I... well. Where do they learn them from? They learn them from the parents. So of course they're going to love the tradition, because you loved it. I know where I stand, and obviously, I mean, it stands to reason, that a lot of my rituals are traditions I've inherited from my mother. Now, in some sense, I've gone in for a bit of sort of daughterly naughtiness and disobedience because my mother always had cranberry sauce out of a jar. But I would certainly say that for me, a Christmas Eve ritual is making cranberry sauce. Making your own cranberry sauce is so much easier than opening that can and trying to smash that form into something that doesn't look like it still has rings on it. All you need to do is get a pan, a packet of cranberries, Empty the cranberries into the pan. Add a snow of sugar, a splash of water, and a really glorious glug of cherry brandy. Then put the heat on, and when the cranberries start boiling, they will start popping. And then when they've all virtually popped, decant into a bowl, and you'll see that although they're cooked, it's slightly runny. The minute the sauce is cold, because there's so much pectin in cranberries, it will be set. My mother always, always made her brandy butter on Christmas Eve. And although I still adhere to the ritual, I deviate from tradition a little, another little act of filial rebelliousness, in that I use rum instead of brandy. For those of you that aren't sure what a brandy or a rum butter is, you will see from this video that it's basically just an American buttercream with some alcohol in it. I mean, this is another incredibly simple recipe. It's just a matter of beating butter with some icing sugar, some of the ground almonds, and then a splash or two or three of rum. Just leave it somewhere cool until tomorrow. Avoid the temptation to plunge in it straight away. And that's the thing, you see, I love that sense of getting ready for Christmas. I'd be so happy to spend the rest of the day pottering about in the kitchen, but I've done everything I need to do. I just, that's it till tomorrow now. We have the same crowd. Right, let's get to it. Got my bowl of Christmas gravy cheer. But first, I'm going to release the turkey from its briny bath. And yes, I did get these in my Christmas stocking. Wow, it looks like something from Creatures of the Deep. Okay, I'm going to wrestle with this. Oh, it is freezing. Bit of an eraser head moment here. Look, I know it's not pretty, well, not at this stage, but it's going to taste fabulous. So, if I leave the turkey to sit and get to room temperature, I am going to get on with the allspice gravy. There's water there, salt. Now, this allspice gravy, in fact, has many flavours and all of them build together to make this kind of very rounded and gorgeous. Celery, never to be underestimated in cooking. Onion, leave the skins on, the colour will help. Carrots, wonderfully sweet. A bit of cinnamon. Bay leaves. And here are the allspice berries and some peppercorns. Now yesterday, I used the zest of this clementine in the stuffing and now 
I'm going to get the juice. Get a bit of pulp as well. The more the merrier. So this does taste of turkey as well. You need the turkey giblets or, failing that, the turkey neck. So, viewers of a sensitive disposition, look away now. And without any more ado, lid on, heat on, and this needs to simmer now for about two hours, and I suppose I ought to go and get dressed. Now is the perfect time to get all the vegetables done and actually don't dread it because I love this part. It's quite relaxed, a bit of mindless repetitive action. I always make him do this part. He acts as my sous chef. And when he doesn't want to be the sous chef, the supervisor sous chef is my little great boy, Ashani. The foil roasting dish. The reason why I've done them quite thin is because I don't want to parboil them and I really want to make sure that they cook inside before they burn on the outside. And I actually am going to roast them in that because I think Christmas is made an awful lot easier if you use throwaway foil roasting dishes rather than ones you have to scrub for hours afterwards. Thank you. And sprouts. I prepare in exactly the same way I remember year in, year out, my mother doing. Making like a cross incision here just to help them cook more evenly. I just do them anyway because my mother did. But the way I cut my potatoes, now that is my patented method for creating the perfect roast potatoes. So I imagine this in a way as if it's going to be cut into a triangle in the middle. So I go like that there and I create the triangle and then I have three pieces with maximum amount of cut sides and it's these cut sides that make all that crunch and crispness. I also think that it's better to give someone six small roast potatoes than two large ones. Anyway, I know I'm right so I'm just going to carry on. Time to parboil the potatoes, which simply means letting them come to a bubble in their salted water and then boil away for four minutes before draining them. And I am going to get on with the turkey. Although the brine makes the turkey fabulously juicy, it does keep it a bit wet. I mean, I've dried it, but it's still a bit wet. So to help the skin crisp up, I am going to melt some butter with some maple syrup. And although I always refer to this as a basting liquid, because I do sort of baste with it, it's really a bronzing liquid, just to make sure the skin gets lovely and brown. For the turkey that I talked about earlier, what I use for my basting liquid is half cup light brown sugar, half cup bourbon, two tablespoons soy sauce, two tablespoons unsalted butter, one teaspoon smoked paprika. Put it on the flame, let those sugars melt into one solid liquid, and then baste away every 20-25 minutes. It creates a dark, ochre, and gorgeous turkey. For a four to five kilo bird, I reckon on about two and a half hours. That'll be perfect. Four to five kilos is basically eight to 10 pounds. Crackers. Ghost chorus again. I love this bit. When everything is just beginning to come together and it gives me a kind of prickle of excitement, I feel that I'm almost there. Anyway, may as well relish it now because it's certainly going to get a bit manic later. Not that there's that much to do really, and I've already got the bread sauce in hand and it's so simple to do, much simpler really than you'd ever think. Oh 
All you need to do is pour some milk into a pan and into the milk throw an onion that's been peeled and quartered, each quarter studied with one clove, add a blade of mace, a few bay leaves, some peppercorns and a scattering of salt. Let all these flavours infuse over heat for a short time and then dig out the onion and crumble in a stalish white loaf, crusts off and sliced. Grate over some fresh nutmeg, stir for a while until all the bread has absorbed the milk and take it off the heat for a while with the lid clamped on. Okay, I know that that looks like baby puke or like old country gravy or oatmeal, but it really is yummy. That spiced, rich cloviness, nutmegginess on top of it is such an awesome addition to your meats. Another thing almost crossed off my checklist is the gingerbread stuffing. All that needs to be done there now is to beat two eggs into it, wadge it into a tureen and pop it in the oven. And this can cook on a rack under the turkey for around an hour. I am about to pass on wisdom for which you will be eternally grateful, or you will be if there's any justice in the world. This is my recipe for the perfect roast potato. These have been parboiled, but instead of dredging them in flour, as is the usual practice, I dredged them, and all the women of my mother's family dredged them, in semolina. And there's a sweetness to semolina and a slight graininess that makes them incredibly crunchy. Bit of a workout to burn off the calories I will replace with the potatoes later. But if this is one important factor, the other equally important factor is that the oil or fat you fry them in must be ferociously hot. You want something with an extremely high smoke point. Now the fat is goose fat and the reason it's so good is because it has a very high smoking point which means you can get it incredibly hot and it won't make the whole room it still smell smells like stuff. and horrible. Plus, it's rather high in omega fatty acids. It's healthy. So I'm telling you now that these roast potatoes are a health food. <laughs> Don't panic if you've just got one oven and therefore you can't get the potatoes in a really hot oven because you can just take the turkey out, tent it in foil, whop the heat up to high and then roast potatoes take about 45 minutes and a turkey will sit covered like that fine. I just have to hear a potato sizzling in the pan and I start to salivate. Oh yeah. The oven's on max, so I feel we're just 45 minutes away from roast potato heaven. You will never want a baked potato again once you have one of those. Much as I relish the chaos and commotion of Christmas, I do think it's important before it all kicks off to snatch a quiet moment so you can go over what you've done, what needs to be done. And I've come to the conclusion that in order to stave off panic, you need to prioritise. So for me, I would so much rather buy a Christmas pudding and make my own rum butter. And all you need to do is put the pudding in a steamer or a saucepan and all that steam coming out is so welcoming, it doesn't matter that you haven't made it yourself. And I've given up parboiling the parsnips. All I do is peel them and cut them small enough so I can just smoosh them around in a tin with some maple syrup and vegetable oil and then 35 minutes or so in an oven and they are gorgeous. Uh, happy Christmas. Party time. I know that sprouts are so often regarded as some sort of Christmas joke, 
but I have to say there's no joke about these. They are seriously good, more than good. A bit different, but not so different that you're shocked. We start off with a bit of oil in my special Christmas decanter. You don't need too much oil because what's going in next, some cut up bits of pancetta, it's bacon really, or lard oil you can get from the supermarket. I love sprouts with chestnuts and I didn't think it was possible to improve on that until I added to match the sweetness of chestnut the saltiness, intense, gorgeous, savoury saltiness of bacon. There's no turning back once you've done that. And now, a little bit of butter. Because I think chestnuts taste best when they've been softened in butter. I mean, the fact that you're not having to cook and peel your own really makes life easier. These have been vacuum packed. Now, this is the bit that brings the saltiness of the pancetta and the sweetness of the chestnuts together. A good splosh of marsala. And now, sprouts still warm. I didn't cook these for very long, about five minutes, because a sprout that is still nutty is immensely good, and a sprout that is blousy and waterlogged is inedible. I've got a lot of parsley, and actually I'm not using this as a garnish, it's really almost as another vegetable in with the sprouts. Leave some for later, but a huge amount on now. The glorious thing about cooking sprouts this way is that sure I those would be they taste better if you sit them in the pan and clamp on a lid. All the taste, the salt of the bacon, the sweetness of the chestnuts will ooze in. And while the sprouts sit there infusing, it gives me... At Thanksgiving, I've been making an agri-dolce sprout, which is you just cut your sprouts in half, put them in the pan with some hot oil, you turn them only three times, they get really charred. Then you add in a sauce made from chopped shallots, fresh cranberries, and maple syrup. And the Brussels sprouts taste like, like sweet and sour from an Asian restaurant. Glazed, sweet, spicy, sour, really yummy. It gives me a chance to grab a quick snifter. I like to get the turkey out of the oven before everyone's absolutely clamoring to sit down at the table and eat. It makes it taste better if it can sit and rest for a while. And besides, it gives me time to do all my bits of finishing touches. To complete the gravy, all I do is put a couple of spoonfuls of flour in a saucepan and whisk in the pan juices from the turkey. And my hot allspice stock has been simmering away for a while now, so I just whisk it in and the gravy's done. Because I like a mood of abundance and plenty to dominate, I get out a vast platter and on one end I tumble out my maple roast parsnips and the rest I clatteringly fill up with my cartoon crunchy roast potatoes. You could serve the bread sauce just as it is and it would be really good, but it is unspeakably fabulous. If you warm it up slightly, add in a knob of butter and a dollop of cream. Mm. The Brussels sprouts really need no further tweaking, although I do like to have a little scattering of freshly chopped parsley if I can. The gingerbread stuffing I serve more or less straight from the oven. And then the final moment of glory awaits, and that is the triumphant bringing out of the turkey. Okay, folks.
Oh, oh. Gorgeous. That is great. I've got more to come. Now this is why Fanny Craddock always used vodka when she was flambeing at the Albert Hall. She could make this burn for 11 minutes. That was her record. <laughs> always used vodka with Christmas pudding. Oh, yeah. She was something. She really was. <laughs> to say we have to have a midnight snack. Now I don't know what that is. It almost looks like anchovy but I'm hoping it's mustard. But what a killer sandwich that would be. <laughs> Another great episode. Since you're watching this, I think I can safely say that you are a foodie or someone who feels passionately about food and how it's prepared. So I've said it once and I'll say it multiple times. One of the many things that I love about Nigella is how simple what did you call me? Her recipes are without missing out on massive flavor. All the while looking fabulous in the kitchen and giving you a warm, tingly feeling down there. I hope your Christmas is filled with great food and your Boxing Day is filled with even better leftovers. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions or just wanna leave a comment, make sure to do so in the section below. I love responding to everyone. Plus, since I'm trying this new foray into reaction videos, it will help new viewers find this channel and try to beat this stupid algorithm. Eat. Enjoy time with your loved ones and make sure to like and subscribe. I'll see you next week. Happy Christmas to you and yours.